Hello, Nature Journal educators. Welcome to our Nature Journal Educators Forum. This is a special edition today, and I am delighted and honored to have a, a special guest with me. Um, today, I am with Art Middlecoff, who is a, um, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of uh, our, our background together. Some years ago, was it, what was the year, Art, that we it met? It was uh, 2016. 2016. So in 2016, um, I went to a Charlotte Mason conference and was exposed to uh, the ideas and teachings of this wonderful educator, Charlotte Mason, um, whose work has inspired a homeschooling movement. And her, as, as a somebody who studies education, who studies, you know, education philosophies and um, and what are the best practices, I found all sorts of crazy alignment with the things that were working for me and also were kind of emerging as best practices in in education that Charlotte Mason had figured out on her own by paying attention mm -hmm. to a kid's um, centuries before. Mm -hmm. And this was, so it was, it was um, really kind of fun for me to go to this conference where um, I was um, presenting like, well, like, you know, okay, here's some stuff that you already know, um, but I'm going to, because that's what Charlotte's saying to do, I'm going to repackage it in a slightly different way. Um, and her writings and teachings also have motivated me to think more about different aspects of, it changed my, my teaching as well. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I met Art. And for me, the, 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 the real jewel in the crown of that whole experience was opportunities to both sit down with Art at dinner um, and mm. at meals. And we, we'd kind of look for each other in the dining hall and beeline <laughs> over to each other. And mm -hmm. because we kept having these conversations Mm -hmm. that were really high percentage and where we'd both be taking notes about what but the other one was you know saying and unpacking and it was it was really fun and then we got to go play in the woods and just kind of you know root around and do mm -hmm. some some walks together so i'm very much looking forward to the next time there is a in-person charlotte mason conference where both of us can be there and um I want to invite everybody come on over to our table because the conversation will be <laughs> hopping at that table. Um, so Art is, um, has researched uh, Charlotte Mason extensively himself and he's gonna sort of tell you a little bit about you know, what, what he's done to do that. He's also um, raised um, and taught his own children with this mm -hmm. system. So mm -hmm. um, both in theory and practice, He's, 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 so I want to just, um, Art has street cred in my book. He's the real deal. And um, has, what we're going to be doing is taking a look into the overlap and intersection between mm -hmm. Charlotte Mason education, um, which even if you are a, not a homeschool parent, um, you're going to want to listen to this because this is, this is, because we're talking about education and nature journaling, the way that mm -hmm. those two come together and um, Art, I'm honored and delighted to, oh, actually first just other logistics. At the, towards the end of this, there's going to be an opportunity for all of us to ask our questions. Right now, we're, we're not able to, to, to do that, but I wanna um, encourage people to put questions into the chat mm -hmm. and um, our co-host Avea um, is going to be, um, Hey, Avea. Um, Avea is going to be monitoring your questions. We'll be collecting those. We'll be passing some of those on to, to, to Art. And um, also at the end of this, you'll have a chance to speak with him um, directly if our time allows for that. But it's gonna be a really interesting class. Thank you all for being here. And um, I would like to um, welcome um, Art Milikoff. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jack. It's wonderful to be here. And it was uh, truly meeting you back in 2016 was was uh, was really a wonderful and really a life changing moment for me. It's uh, it's a year that I'll certainly never forget. Um, maybe I can just share a little bit about myself. So um, so I'm a father of three children. Two of them are now in college, but one of them is still at home 
Um, we, my wife and I, we've been homeschooling since day one. And it's really because of homeschooling that I learned about Charlotte Mason back in 2003. Um, but my interest in Charlotte Mason's philosophy went beyond just what I needed to just implement homeschool in my own family. Um, researching and writing about Charlotte Mason's ideas has become kind of a second vocation for me. And so um, I ended up starting a website, a podcast, and I work with a team of volunteers. And together we research and publicize Charlotte Mason's philosophy of education. And uh, the podcast that we run is called Charlotte Mason Poetry. Um, we just recently put out our 200th episode. So that was a, a big uh, milestone for us. And uh, I think what was so pivotal, Jack, about meeting you back in 2016 is that, you know, I'd read so much about Charlotte Mason's ideas on nature study, but it was still hard for me to, to visualize some of what it looked like in practice. And uh, so, so meeting you and, and seeing you doing it live helped me to kind of help those ideas to click. And it's really revolutionized my own experience of nature. And, uh, and so the succeeding years have, have been wonderful for me to get to deepen my own relationship with nature as well as, as, as help my children. So I'm, um, I'm really grateful that we get a chance to, 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 to pick your brain about this. So a lot of people who are, are watching, have, this is the first time they're hearing of Charlotte Mason. So it might be useful just to give people a little bit of the backstory about um, sort of who, who Charlotte Mason is. And then perhaps we can move into sort of what are her kind of the, the core fundamental principles of then of sort of, 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 of Mason's theory and, and practice of education. And by the way, everybody notice that this is, so we'll put this uh, in, in a time reference. This is at a time that there was a, the, all the examples, if you kind of looked around at like, how can I best do um, education? The examples that she would have been looking at are really, it's all just top down, open up the top of your head, pour information mm -hmm. in um, and, uh, at, at lower elementary to university levels. That was, uh, the, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll hear her say some things. You're like, you know, like, oh yeah, that kind of seems to jive with like current I, I, ideas of things. Mm -hmm. But just sort of put in context that she is an absolute revolutionary. Mm -hmm. That's right. In, that's in, right. In so let's, let's. Yeah, that's right. I mean, she was so ahead of her time, Jack, in so many ways. And uh, so Charlotte Mason's kind of like the, the great educationist that no one's heard of, you know? And so, um, so it's wonderful to have the opportunity to talk about her. Here, she was born in 1842 in England, very humble beginnings. Um, starting in 1886, she wrote uh, a series of books on homeschooling and educational theory. She developed a program of study for homeschool families and for schools. She established a teacher training college and a monthly journal. And so by the year of her death in 1923, uh, the Times in England said that her influence on education was, quote, probably more widespread than that of any educationist of her time. Um, pretty remarkable legacy. And uh, so one person, there's uh, Dr. Stephanie Spencer of the University of Winchester. She wrote a paper in 2010 about Charlotte Mason and she summed it up this way. She said, Charlotte Mason is the woman who from very obscure beginnings developed and introduced innovative ideas into educational theory and practice in state and independent schools while holding her ground against social superiors who challenged her theories. And one of the things that Stephanie Spencer talks about and observes is that Charlotte Mason was kind of outside of the system. Um, and so she was able to sidestep, you know, kind of the, the power centers of class and gender and was able to get her ideas out there and have a huge impact. And so the question becomes, wow, you know, if she was so well known that the Times would say this about her in 1923, you know, how come we haven't heard of her or how did she come back? So. Um, some people have heard of uh, Susan Schaefer McCulley. Um, Susan Schaefer McCulley went to England 
And in the 1980s, she discovered Charlotte Mason and wrote a book in 1984 called For the Children's Sake. And that book launched a rebirth of interest in Charlotte Mason, particularly among American homeschoolers, but not limited to America. So this resurgence of interest is all over the world. There's people in Brazil, in France, in Indonesia, in, in Canada, in England, all with this renewed interest in Charlotte Mason. And, uh, you know, the fascinating thing about her um, is that, uh, you know, a lot of us tend to either focus on theory and be really intellectual, and then there's other kind of people who really focus on practice and get really practical. One thing that's totally unique about Charlotte Mason is that she was really end to end. And so at her death, one of her close associates wrote, it is surely a rare thing that a philosopher should translate his philosophy into practical life as Miss Mason did. Many philosophers are content with the supreme joy of intellectual effort. Others are content with making experiments. But Miss Mason put each dictum of her philosophy to the test of daily life and its needs. So theoretical ideas, but also just nitty gritty practical. And I think that's part of what makes her so appealing to homeschoolers, because she kind of not only gives us the inspiration and the ideas, but she also gives us a lot of the how to, you know, hey, you've got me all inspired about this. Now, what do, what do I actually do in practice? Yeah, that, um, there is, there's, you know, even to this day, we have lots of educational theory that kind of gets developed in a think tank somewhere. Yeah. Um, but the, but this is, but this is, is, is boots on the ground. So she That's had right. experience directly teaching children and then teaching teachers mm -hmm. how to teach children. And so was able to perfect that. So we have not just, and, and I think that when, when you start trying to teach people something about, uh, when you're trying to teach teachers, it forces you to really think about and articulate your ideas in a really, uh, in a different and more profound way. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so there was about, you know, she'd had lots of teaching experience firsthand with children and even with then starting to teach, um, you know, governesses and other teachers before she started to really write out her own ideas. So it wasn't until, you know, born in 1842, it wasn't until 1886, so 44 years later that she actually started synthesizing all of this lifetime of learning and, uh, and collecting it in, in volumes. And so I can give you some examples of how um, she went from, from, from theory and idea into practice. Um, Jack, is it okay if I kind of summarize for yeah. you just a couple of the key points? I, I, I would actually, was, I was going to ask you to, to, to do that because that would be really helpful to, um, so if we could kind of rarefy like her, her key points, yeah. um, um, and if, if those are specifically things that relate to nature journaling, that's great, or if it just kind of helps kind of see the, 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 the whole of the cloth, let's go there. So uh, what, let's take a look at what Mason came up with. Yeah, so I mean, I think what she's probably most well known for is this, what she called her first principle. And her first principle is summed up in this idea that children are born persons. And what she means by that is that children are born complete human beings, complete persons that have an innate ability to grow and to learn. And in many ways, Jack, I know you talk a lot about the, the, the idea of a growth mindset. And, and I think that this children are born persons is really an early expression of, of a lot of those concepts behind the growth mindset. Um, on this topic, Charlotte Mason wrote that our business is to feed the child daily with the knowledge proper to him because he is a person, rather than to furnish him with the tools for dealing with knowledge or even to make him an expert in the use of these tools. So in other words, we don't need to be mediators or, or, or treat children as if they have no ability to grasp ideas or to recognize beauty or to make observations. They're born with that. And so our job is to put them in contact with these wonderful ideas, not to give them the tools as if they, as if they don't have that innate ability. Um, a second really important concept that she's very well known for um, is uh, she, she's well known for developing an, an instrument of education. I, I mean, yeah, go for uh, it. Just uh, inter, inter, uh, interrupt for, for a second here, because this, this first principle is now um, the cutting edge of sort of scientific educational best practices. Uh, mm -hmm. We talk about that we've, um, 
that 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 the kind of engaging people with the phenomena so mm. phenomena based education um mm. rather than like here's some stuff in some books we're going to but getting in there with this stuff and manip and 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 that experience is it makes whatever you're doing meaningful you learn so much better so she was on to this sort of new wave of phenomena based education way back in 1886 or earlier right i mean i mean she was so and she was uh, she was writing about neuroplasticity back in the 1880s um she was talking about how our brains can be formed and shaped by the things that we do we're not limited by some category that we're born into which is classic growth mindset so so these ideas um she was developing are it's just taken um kind of the rest of us you know more than 100 years to catch up with this and and so you know a second key idea she's very well known for this concept called narration and when that's a very specific term when she says narration it's based on her her notion she said that knowledge is not assimilated knowledge is not assimilated until it's reproduced so she said children should tell back after a single reading or hearing or they should write some part of what they have read so let me put it this way the way i like to say it in a nutshell is the basic idea is you learn not by what you hear by what but by what you say Right. So you can hear all kinds of stuff and it'll go in one ear and out the other. But when you say it, then you've learned it. And I think, Jack, that even gets to your point about teaching teachers. There's something about having to teach somebody that crystallizes the learning and the knowledge in her head. So narration was a, a, a huge element. And then the third big area that she's known for. Do you want to you want to comment on that, Jack? So, yeah, just ju just to sort of t to tag into that, yeah. because um, what we're we're, we're We've had actually lots of discussions about this with in here in the Nature Journal Educator Forum. Mm -hmm. This this I idea that our brains are completely overwhelmed by the data stream that's coming in, mm -hmm. and by by choosing what you're going, you're selecting out deliberately from this data dump what is meaningful to you, and you're translating that down onto the page. That's right. So the narration can be, I can be talking to you about it, um, or it can be, I'm writing it down on the page and making a diagram of this idea. And mm -hmm. that um, we, we, we I, see, I see sort of two really strong parallels. One, we talk a lot about just the production effect. And, and this is something where if, if, I, if I say, if I'm observing something, I then, the bird flies away and I go like, what was I seeing? But all I have to do is as the bird is there, I start talking out loud, having this conversation with the bird about all my observations and my notices, my wonders, and it reminds me of. And that process of being verbally engaged with the bird, now the bird flies away and all that stuff that I've been saying, it's still there accessible to me in my short term memory. Um, for me to then to do the next thing with and that the journal works in the same way that I'm collecting these these things I'm choosing what is significant and meaningful I'm making. Um, sort of taking this experience. It comes into me and then it comes out onto the piece of paper and that's. Mm -hmm. My thinking then made visible to myself. And that also allows me to then do metacognition. I can look and see the way that I'm thinking, just as the way that the parent might be able to listen to and hear the way that, that the child is thinking. And also, if, if I'm a child and I'm saying these things out loud, I hear myself say it. Like, I don't know how many times I've started to say something and then it gets partway out my mouth and I go, like, oh, wait a minute, that's not a really good idea. Um, so the journaling is working in the same way as this. So I, I think of journaling is narration that's right that's right jack and and uh, you know i think um you know i think you grew up right jack in nature like your parents were naturalists and took you outdoors a lot and so you know i didn't that i didn't have that experience and so for me discovering nature i'm kind of an example of that growth mindset and the idea that an old dog can learn new tricks and so i've learned how to go out and observe nature but it's been a real bootstrap effort for me and i remember jack you helped me to grasp this principle of narration just in the context of, of observing so i'll be looking through my binoculars and i'll see a bird 
and I'll look away and I can't for the life of me remember anything about what I just saw. And so one of the techniques that you talked about at the conference in 2016 was just start talking about what you're seeing. So I'll be with you know, my wife or with my son, I'll be looking and I'll say, okay, okay, so the, the bird's got a white head. I'll just start verbalizing what I'm seeing because I'm gonna remember what I'm saying. Because what I see, it just, it just, it doesn't, I, I doesn't retain it. Like, but, but the act of expressing engages a part, parts of your brain that lead to retention. And so this principle of reproducing as you're learning, whether verbally, in writing, in drawing, in painting, in whatever form, um, it's the creation, it's the production effect, it's the creation that is the learning process. And it's such a powerful concept in, in, uh, for adults and for children in so many different aspects of life. So the idea, if you see something, say something. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then I think a, a third thing, if I was just to put one more principle that Charlotte Mason is most well known for, it's that she's a huge advocate of nature study, of being out in nature. And I'll just share one, one quote. She said that it seems to me a sine qua non of a living education that all school children of whatever grade should have one half day in the week throughout the year in the fields and a sine qua non that's latin for without which nothing so in other words she's saying that if you don't like if you're not spending at least a half day through the entire year in the fields don't talk to me about that you're giving your children a living education like it's an essential um, and so people will ask me hey i'm into charlotte mason but do i really have to do the nature study thing i'm like well this I mean, I'm sorry. It's like, I'm just telling, I'm just the messenger. Charlotte Mason said that that's the essence of a living education in her mind. If you're not in a nature, you're not doing it. And so the fascinating thing about nature journaling is that it really brings these three points all together because nature journaling, you have to be out in nature, first of all. So that's kind of that, that third point. Nature journaling makes the assumption that the child as a person is born with the ability to make his or her own direct observations from nature and doesn't need a mediator or a guide to say, this is now what you're seeing, and this is what you're seeing, and this is what you should look for, but that a child as a person has the ability to make his or her own observations. And thirdly, this idea of narrating or reproducing what you're learning, the journal is the place to capture that. So, so this, this technique or this artifact, this idea of a keeping a nature journal pulls together these three strands or big ideas of Charlotte Mason into one concrete activity. And that's what I meant in the beginning when I said, her, her ideas are not just for ethereal philosophy that then you have to kind of come up with some way to put into practice. Like this ethereal philosophy comes together with very tangible, meaningful, actionable ways that have been time tested and proven and, and nature journaling is, is a premier example of that. Yeah, the, yeah, the and, and this kind of gives you, you think about the role then of the educator in this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the, the cutting edge right now of uh, environmental education um, are, are these materials that are being developed by the Lawrence Hall of Science, what they call their Beatles program. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to get environmental outdoor educators to transition from this old role, which we had with the kind of the sage on the stage, mm -hmm. where you know all these things about nature and I'm gonna walk you up and bring you up to the redwood tree. And I'm going to tell you things about the redwood tree and why you should love this redwood tree. Mm -hmm. And then that how somehow is going to change your way of thinking and connecting. And if you're gonna somehow connect through that or even the, the, the people who do this sort of stuff, they are called interpreters. So <laughs> nature needs an interpreter, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't speak nature. So, so we need a, a, an, an interpreter to help you be able to, to help you be able to connect with nature. Right, um, yeah. And, and then the, the, they're trying to get people to kind of go from that role which there's lot, I have, I have books, I have manuals of how to be an interpreter. And it's all about like, you're going to study this sort of stuff. And, you know, sometimes you're, you're kind of make it kind of playful and fun for people to kind of come along with me. And some people do a really good entertaining job of that, but it's still, they are the wall between you and the phenomenon. 
And so it's not phenomenon based experience. It's from my brain to yours. So they're trying to go from the sage on the stage, the stage to the idea of the guide on the side and giving kids sort of curiosity prompts and things, and then letting them get into that Charlotte Mason style, that direct experience, that direct encounter with nature. Um, and, you know, th they're, this is so, you know, you're thinking like, this is nothing new, but, edu but, but the people who are teaching these sort of Beatles principles now mm -hmm. at outdoor schools and other places, they're getting, they're getting pushbacks. There's lots of institutions that have a kind of, there's a long history of, I've gotten really, I mean, I used to teach this way, right? Because when right. I was starting mm -hmm. environmental education, I thought I'm going to go, I'd have to do a redwood forest hike. I'm going to study all my stuff about redwood forests. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to learn all this sort of stuff. And I could bring a group around. I could keep them entertained. Mm -hmm. I had good group management. Um, I could do some call and response stuff that gave me the false sense of their understanding and assimilating what I'm doing. But that was, I, I was following a model that was well-established. And it's none of these things, except for mm -hmm. we were in nature but you are, you're kind of getting to nature through me. Exactly, and I think you, I remember you describing, Jack, when you were in that sage on a stage mode back in the day and how you would take kids around for a nature walk and the main thing that they learned, you know, if you were to ask them, you know, the next day, what did you learn from that walk with Jack? They say, I learned that Jack knows a lot about trees. That's yeah. the main thing that they learned. Uh, but did they actually learn anything about trees? Did they, you know, and so what, what I think your, your transformation, Jack, was when you learned that you modeled, you modeled behavior. You, you said, hey, if you, wanna, if you wanna do nature study with me, then you're gonna do nature study with me. So Jack, you would sit down and you'd just start making your observations and they would say, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. And that, that was from the very beginning of Charlotte Mason from her first 1886 book, when she, her first comment about nature study, I'm just gonna read this, this earliest quote that we have from her. She said, the child who spends an hour in watching the ways of some new grub he has come upon will be a man of mark yet. Let all he finds out about it be entered in his diary. Where he finds it, what is it doing, or what does it seem to him to be doing? Its color, its shape, its legs. Someday he will come across the name of the creature and will recognize the description of an old friend. Do you see how we tend to the common thinking today is to turn around? It's like when I started, I first thought that it was all about the name. You got to get the name. And it's like, how am I, how can I teach? How can I do nature study with my children if I don't know the names of stuff? And what Charlotte Mason is saying here is that the name can come years later. The name is like the last thing that happens. It's like once, once you've discovered, you know, let's what, what she said to write down. Where did you find it? What is it doing? What or what does it seem to be to you to be doing? Even if you don't know what it's doing, you can guess or wonder about what it's doing. What is its color? What is its shape? What are its likes? Write those things down, and then five, ten, you know, years down the road, you get the name. And oh, so that's what that's. But but you already have a name for it, and we do that today. We we refer to. Um, there's a there's a plant that I've seen in in uh, in our my nature walks with my son and. We have no idea what the plant is, and uh, there, there's a leaf that my son said it looks like saber. So we call it the saber plant. Someday we'll know what it's really called, but for now we're trying to spot at different seasons to see its life cycle and stuff like that. And I've, I've realized that that process of discovery is far more important than naming, because when we name something, then we think we're done. When we name something, but then we think that there's nothing more to learn, or we've we've caught up with everything biology has to say about the subject. And and you know, Jack, you've helped me to to realize that that uh, just because you identify something as an eastern bluebird, there there is much as much difference between one eastern bluebird and another as there is between one human being and another to say, well, I've spotted an eastern bluebird. Well, but but have you spotted that one? Have you spotted that one? And if you tell me about this one and how he's different from that one and how this one flies differently or acts differently, there's so much richness. And so don't get to know just a species or a category. Get to know a bird. Get to know one particular bird and see what he's doing that's different from the others. That, that is, that is, that is, is so profound. That cuts to the heart of being, because when you are, if you are actually in presence with nature, 
then it is there is this individual this thou of a bird that is in front of you you're not in front of eastern bluebirds right <laughs> you're in front of this there's this amazing moment and if we kind of rarefy it to just that name we kind of miss that moment um and, and in those examples of what you said charlotte mason said the student should be thinking about it was she was role modeling asking questions yes mm -hmm. asking question asking question the, the the student will be saying this and this and this and this and this and this and this so built into this is deliberate curiosity mm -hmm. and being vulnerable to not knowing not having the answer so this is she's looking at this science of this investigation as a process as opposed to um, to science as as a as a bunch of stuff in a book that you have memorized, it, it's the difference between relationship and mastery. You know, I think oh, when you when you think of, this is going to be cool. Yeah, because I mean, I think when when you think of, of of learning or education as as attaining mastery over a domain of knowledge. Um, I think then you've taken the life out of out of education. But if you think of, of education as a relationship to be formed, then you have a lifelong experience. And so mastery means that there's just a certain quantity. There's a there's a there's a quota. I need to gain be be awarded this mastery of this set of facts and I've attained this level. This set of facts I've attained this level. Um, but we want to be in relationship. We want to be in relationship with nature and with all other elements of what we're learning. And and you know Charlotte Mason wrote that uh, she was very clear that the nature diary. She said in this she said the nature diary should be left to the child's own initiative. In other words, it's not a lecture. It's not a set of facts. It's not like you say, my objective, okay, this year you're gonna learn these 10 facts by hook or by crook. We're gonna keep going to this nature spot until you learn about these 10 things that I've decided you're gonna learn about nature. But instead it's actually, we're gonna get out in nature and the child is going to is going to form his or her own interests and is going to record and write about those things because if it's not if it's not your initiative of what you're writing about it's not your nature journal anymore it's somebody else's and so i write about the stuff that's important to me my wife writes about the stuff that's important to her my son writes about the stuff that's important to me important to him sorry that the stuff is important to him and we all have have different takeaways and uh, that that's so important and that's about relationship versus mastery that is, I, 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 in my little notes that I'm taking over here, I put a big star next, next to that. Because um, you're, what you're also there talking about is how do you create somebody who's intrinsically motivated to be a lifelong learner? Yeah, and that's a wonderful that's a wonderful indication because this is back to Charlotte Mason's first principle as children are born persons because she actually believed that children are actually, that that's our natural state. We are born curious with, an, with a hunger to know. And that's why little kids are always asking questions. They're always seeking, they're always wondering, they're always, but she said that school beats it out of you. The, the basically like the, 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 the typical experience of school is that it drives that, curi that innate curiosity and desire to know. And instead it gradually replaces that. And so instead of, learning because of that built-in hunger for knowledge, you start to learn because you want to get better grades, or you start to learn because you want to do better than somebody else. And then what happens is when learning is not an end to itself, when learning is a way to get scores or to get grades or to get ahead or to get praise or to be the winner or to get a scholarship or to get into college or to pass a test, then what happens is that the learning is, is secondary. And so as soon as you obtain the, the result, which is your test score or your college or whatever, all the learning just gets flushed out because you, you don't, it, it was never an end to itself. It was always a means to an end. And so that's why you end up with people who can go through school and get a degree in biology and have no actual interest in going outdoors and actually encountering life after they've graduated because it was the degree that was important, not the biology. And so it was interesting, Charlotte Mason wrote in, in 1895, um, she, wrote, she wrote this, I'll quote, at a former meeting of the British Association, the president, lamented that the progress of science was greatly hindered by the fact that we no longer have field naturalists 
close observers of nature as she is. So back in 1895, the British Association is saying science is dead because we don't have naturalists anymore. We don't have people who are going to go out and closely observe nature as it is. And so Charlotte Mason said, I've got the remedy. Let us, quote, before yeah. all things be nature lovers, because the true scientist is not the one who can pass a test in college. The true scientist is the one who knows how to make observations, whether it's outdoors or in the lab or whatever. Who's making the great discoveries? It's not the person who's mastered test taking skills or has memorized the most number of facts or can who, or who, who can co coalesce and reproduce a textbook. It's the person who can go out and discover something new. And that means the person who's gotten their fingers dirty, whether it's dirty in the lab with chemicals or whether it's dirty outdoors in, in I mean, who, who, how do you, how are you going to learn about the, the do cutting edge research in the migration of birds or cutting edge research in any element of nature if you're not willing to go out there and get dirty, get cold, get wet? Right. And, that happens in nature. And so that, that, that quote was when, when they're, they're, they're saying that uh, you sort of know more people kind of getting their boots dirty. What, that was in what year? 1895. Um, 1895. Please send me that that <laughs> reference because what's hilarious yes. about that is that the same lament has mm -hmm. recently been published as mm -hmm. as as uh, by 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 natural by, by by biologists saying that we're, we've yeah we're they're, they're they're saying the same thing about like you know now you know we, we were doing it but but now there's so that that same observation. Um, Is 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 still on the minds of biologists today, um, and I can sort of send you um, an article that will be kind of the 2.0 version of that same yeah. se sentiment. Um, and because yeah, it's just it's it's just a fact of history that 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 academics being an being an excellent academic right. is not being an excellent scientist. Right, and, and and that that's that's the same challenge today that that the British Association was observing more than a hundred years ago. This is this is beautiful, um, and there's also this wonderful research on kind of just the number of questions that kids ask when they in 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 a day. And anybody who's who's been a parent knows that when you've got youngsters, it's like question, 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 question. That's right. Question, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Um, then as we go into our elementary education, you see the number of questions that kids are asking plummet yeah, it's so sad. at exactly the same time that their sort of expressed interest in, in, scientists, in science um, and the world, because that's kind of what science is, um, um, also crashes. And so the idea is that it's that the reason why our engagement with the world drops is also because we've is because we're not asking those questions. And those questions are they are the invitation to building that relationship. And then the more that you but in school, we reward people, not for asking the question, but for having the right answer. Right. So they give the questions, we get the blank where we fill in the answer. So our role then becomes not question seekers, not curious people, but, but answerers. And as we get, and we get to the point where you get better and better at having all the right answers. Um, my friend Kevin Beals, uh, part of the Beatles team at, at Lawrence Hall of Science makes this joke about, you know, you watch a group of kids in a, some environmental education classroom and, you know, some people will be asking questions and then, you know, invariably there will be kids who will just raise their hand and say, photosynthesis uh, uh, as, as, as just, an answer to any question that has come up because they've they've seen the pattern that very often that's the right answer to whatever is being asked. So the idea is just you, know, you throw up your hand and say photosynthesis, and then people are like, "That's right, photosynthesis." And so yeah, we're we're collecting, we're, we're we're we get good at answerers, and that also makes us more vulnerable to the mysteries that we don't know. 
And then what happens, Jack, is that we turn the table. So what happens is children start curious and then we say, no, 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 stop asking questions. Just learn the answers. We take them all the way through college, grad school, whatever, where they're just, and then we introduce them to the real world. And in the real world, we have problems to solve where we need people who are gonna explore and investigate and innovate. Whether you are building software, which is actually my profession, we need innovators. I don't need people who are gonna, who are gonna answer questions that have been answered 10 or 20 years ago. I need people who are gonna go into new directions and create new, pro new ideas. And, and so you go into science and we want people who are gonna discover and probe into new areas. So we, 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 we educate away curiosity and then we tell them to go into careers where curiosity is the core thing that we're paying for. We want innovators. We want researchers. We want creative thinkers. We want problem solvers. But we train people to not be that. So, so it's like we're kind of going the opposite direction. We're turning, you know, it, we, we are, we're, it's actually a bait and switch. It's like the moment that you graduate from your last college class or university class, we do a bait and switch and say, oh, by the way, there's actually a whole completely different mindset and skill set that now you need to excel at in this the rest of your life. Um, and that that is the reason that the so the, the the this this that exactly that observation the people at the National Academy of Sciences observed that we get people with college degrees who cannot do science. That's right. And so they worked at kind of re-envisioning what should science education look like right. and came up with the next generation science standards. Mm -hmm. And if you, um, and the, the idea is that we want to get people doing this and they, they're, so they're now part of, oh, silence you machine. Sorry, I thought I had pushed that little button that makes my phone be all quiet. Um, the, oh no, it's not. Okay, now it is. So. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're trying to, for, for years we have taught science education as, yeah, memorize this list of stuff. I, my mind blew up when you, you said this thing. I just have to put a little circle and a star next to it. You said, we educate away curiosity. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that kind of summarizes so much of Charlotte Mason's life work was to try to correct that tragedy. And she believed that children were born persons and she wanted to preserve that curiosity. And so Jack, we've talked a lot about science. I wanna mention though that, that nature study is as powerful as it is as a foundation for science learning. It's actually more than that. And I wanna just bring out um, three other elements that, that Charlotte Mason pointed to as valuable in nature study. First of all, she said that young children learn, she said more from things than from words. Um, so, so she was. She actually said that during the first six years of a child's life, most of their education should be out of doors and exploring in nature, because that's going to be so much more the tangible and the things they pull in from their senses is going to be so much more um, powerful for their early education than words. Um, I can't imagine what she would say now when children spend their first six years in front of an iPad, which is even worse than than being raised by words. Um, but I know you're trying to shut me up. Let's, can I mute this? So, but, but getting outdoors. And so, so that was the first thing. Second thing is that she said that children early contact with nature is what gives children, she said, a lifelong sense of beauty. Um, and so Jack, you talked about this concept. I remember when you spoke, uh, how when you go on nature walks, you say, let's stop and take a beauty break. Let's stop and just take a moment to recognize and observe what's beautiful around us. So Charlotte Mason, uh, based on the neuroscience, late 19th century neuroscience, she believed that actually neurologically, we are, our, our, uh, our brain kind of comprehension of beauty is derived from nature. So the things that we think are beautiful in art and in statues and in architecture and so on are beautiful only to the extent to which they reflect the beauty in nature. So beauty, our highest pattern of nature is beauty. And then all art that humans create is a kind of reflection of that beauty that comes first in nature. So if you want, so we've talked a lot about science, but let's put it another way. If you want your child to be able to, uh, first of all, just be able to appreciate fine art, 
or, or even, or to be able to produce fine art and to become, let's say a painter or a sculptor or something like that, expose them to nature, take them outside, enforce, you know, do the beauty break, have them gaze at the landscape, have them gaze at the sky, have them gaze at the stars, because that's forming and reinforcing their natural sense of beauty. And that becomes patterns for their expression of art and beauty through the rest of, of life. And then a, a third area where nature study is so important is in developing and preserving the habit of observation and becoming, and the skills that the, the most, um, kind of naturally enticing environment to develop the skill of observation is being out in nature. You can, um, but once you have the habit of observation that can become powerful in so many other parts of life. But the idea here is that um, it's hard to develop the habit of observation from something that's not as, not, not as interesting. But nature is is wonderful and dynamic and and enticing and and uh, and 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 makes it easier to develop that habit. But once you have that habit, you can take that habit of observation to all other areas of life. So that's why nature study is such a foundational element to um, not only science but also art, aesthetics, observation, and even early childhood education. I've. I've this is, is fascinating. Part of also what we've discussed is like, you know, what is your kind of search image as you are, as a naturalist exploring in nature? And for, for me, it's exactly what Mason is talking about here. It's wonder and beauty. Yeah. Wonder and beauty. And so as I'm going out in the field, I'm looking for the things that make me go, huh, like, oh, that's mm -hmm. weird. What's happening there? Mm -hmm. That's wonder. And the things that make you go, oh. <clears throat> and then, as you practice it, I love it how she says this habit of observation. And mm -hmm. she's, I mean, she's full on with the growth mindset. So this is, yes. it's a habit. It's something you can learn to do. It's a skill right. that you can develop. It's not something that you're born for. She's not talking about the gift of observation. It's the habit. Yes. And you can't, it's, you can't say, I, I'm just not an observant person. Well, you know, Jack, I, I wish yeah. that I could be like you, but I'm just not an observant person. You know that, no, no, the, the, your brain is plastic. Your brain, if you, you, you know what, just go out and start observing and come back in a year and you're gonna be an observant person. So anytime you wanna say, I'm not an observant person, that's only true if you add the word now on the end or yet. Ah. I'm not an observant person yet. I'm not a math person yet. I'm not an art yeah. person yet. I'm not a journal. I'm, you know, I would love to do nature journaling, but I'm just not a, I'm just not a journaling type. Sorry, you need to add that comma yet because you can become that because your brain is plastic and your brain will form those things just by doing them. By doing, you become. And that's the gift. That's the miracle. That's the wonder of, of the, the plastic brain. And that's, that's the thing that's one, that makes it so exciting to be a human being is that you are not locked in by some kind of some kind of like destiny that that you're born with you're not locked into that you you don't have to wistfully look and say boy if only i could if only i could just go out and do and you will become and uh, and so it, it and so you know you you jack you talk sorry go ahead <laughs> no this, no no yeah okay. I mean, I, I've got it. I mean, I, I want to just I want to tie in on, on a different note about you were talking about, you know, one of the things that, you know, your model, you talk about, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And uh, I remember at the conference, we, we pointed out it back in 2016 that Charlotte Mason talks about those three things. So I just going to show you that I notice. Um, she said that, um, that, that uh, the sad thing about childish recollections of, of most persons is that they're blurred, distorted, incomplete. And the reason is, not that the old scenes are forgotten, but that they were never fully seen. And what does I notice, but mean to be fully seen? And so with I notice, we're trying to fully see something so that it's not where we, we, we see a scene, but we walk away and we can't remember it because it was never fully seen. And that's what noticing is about. And I wonder, Charlotte Mason said, where science does not teach a child to wonder and admire, it has perhaps no educative value. So how many science, so, so according to her, how many science textbooks don't have educative value from that point of view? If it's not teaching you to wonder and admire, yeah. what, is it, what is it doing for you? Now, now of course we have to is go and science, look at books. Is, is it a noun or a verb? 
you know? Right, 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 right. And so I wonder, and then it reminds me of, you know, I thought to myself, well, surely, you know, this, it reminds me of Charlotte Mason couldn't possibly, that's got to be like a Jack Laws thing. That can't be a Charlotte Mason thing until I came across, until we came across uh, where, where this, this anecdote where she says, the mother will say, look at the reflection of the trees. She's standing with a child in front of a lake and you're seeing the reflection of the trees. It looks like there might be wood under the water. What do those standing up leaves remind you of? What do they remind you of? And so even Charlotte Mason back, you know, more than hundred years ago, she was, she was patterning this idea of it reminds me of. And so when I, and, and uh, when I, when I'm going to nature walks with my son and he says, wow, this looks like, or this reminds me of, I think about that. And instead of just dismissing those moments, those, it reminds me of moments, instead of thinking, well, who cares if it reminds you of a saber? Who cares if it reminds you of this or the other thing? I'm realizing, wow, that's actually, that's a relationship forming. That's, that's a connection with nature forming. That's an understanding forming. So instead of discounting those, because those aren't the answer, don't tell me what, it, you know, don't tell me what it reminds you of. Tell me its name. Tell me what species of tree that is. Tell me the name of that nut or the name of that leaf, or tell me the leaf pattern, or don't tell me what it reminds me of. Wait a, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm getting into the answer mode instead of into the wonder and relationship mode. So now I cherish those moments. When I hear my son say, you know what this reminds me of? You know what this looks like? I think, wow, now something is happening. A connection is being formed. Um, so uh, so those three things I noticed, I wonder, I, it reminds me of in Beauty Break. Those are like core to Charlotte Mason uh, nature study model. And, and you've actually just here made me think about the it reminds me of in a, in a different way. Um, I've thought about the it reminds me of as being the invitation to creative thinking um, with mm. the definition of creativity mm. as your brain's ability to make useful connections between seemingly unrelated things. And here what you're inviting me to do is to think of the it reminds me of as, as a relationship building tool that's mm. also going to make whatever you're looking at more relevant. Mm -hmm. What is um, as I'm finding those, it reminds me of, I'm building those relationships with the natural world. And yeah. um, that's... And it's creating a hook for curiosity, right? Because now that, that, thing has been, that thing has been established more deeply. It's passed from you know, that, that kind of um, temporary memory into that deeper long-term memory. Because we remember the things that we have emotional attachment to. We're much more likely to remember and retain something when we feel an emotion about it. And if something reminds you of something, then you create that emotional attachment, you start to retain it, and it starts to increase your love for that particular object. Um, so I think it's a very powerful tool. And again, it's something that, you know, I, I think there's so much that we as educators, as home educators or school teachers, there's so much um, wonderful things happening before our very eyes that we don't celebrate because we don't realize just how powerful it, it we don't realize that the learning that's taking place. We dismiss things as being insignificant or childish because they don't rank up with our rubric of what's important, but we're missing the fact that these are the truly powerful lasting moments of education. And so we need to, we need to change our rubric. We kind of need to turn it around. We need to celebrate those moments of, of curiosity, of wonder, of beauty, and, and especially those moments of creativity and those moments moments of, of relationships forming. And Jack, I was wondering, could I just take a minute to just also talk a little bit about the nature notebook itself? There's just a few things I wanted to share yep. about that, if that's Ooh. all right. Um, so I just wanted to point out that, uh, that in Charlotte Mason's uh, schools and in her teacher uh, training college, they developed a, a, a very clear kind of set of, of elements that make up a nature notebook. And there's kind of four key ingredients that I just wanna share about. One of them is the use of drawing or painting. And so the idea is form, color, and gesture. So um, painting or drawing tends to fix it in the memory. Um, a second one is the use of notes. Um, and that includes things like the date. And I'm kind of, re I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing some quotes as I'm reading this to you. So the notes would include the dates describing where it was found and anything noticeable about the climate or season in which it was developed. A third interesting element is the use of, of lists and tables. So what happened is um, in the early days, the nature notebooks, they used to start kind of noting uh, flowers and birds seen just kind of interspersed in the notebook. What they started to do later is create tables at the back of your notebook. So 
said that you could basically, when, when was the first time you saw a particular type of bird or when did the first kind of tree or, or flower appear and that sort of thing. So creating these tables. Um, so it's basically now adding the chronological elements so the time dimension, which I know Jack, you point out as being one of the elements of observation that we wanna do. And so these tables or lists was a key element. And then the fourth element, which brings in yet another dimension of how nature study um, synthesizes so much of education is this element of quotations from the poets. So I'll read an example here. Uh, I'll read a quote. This is from uh, one of uh, Charlotte Mason's closest associates um, and who went on to be the science director at her teacher training college, um, Agnes Drury. She said, quote, the quotations from the poets are the aptest expression of our own feelings about nature. Verses chosen spontaneously from the daily reading and recitation of poetry can be entered not as a substitution for the individual notes, but as a beautiful addition to them. And so now you have poetry. So not only is nature building your beauty sense, but actually there's a literary element. Um, so now actually what's happening is you're collecting, you're connecting the literary expression of poetry into, so if you, it's hard to imagine a single activity in all of education that is more multidisciplinary than the nature notebook itself. Because here in the nature notebook itself, you are recording a relationship with nature, scientific observations, artistic expression, color and aesthetic and beauty, as well as written observations, the habit of observation, the narration and reproduction of what you're learning. And on top of that, if that wasn't enough, you're bringing in your, your poetic expression and you're tying in what you're learning through your literature classes. It's all coming together. and so and so. So uh, I like to say that nature study is the intersection of science, art, and poetry. Um, and it's, it's, it's what, what else is there like that? And I think that there's, there's a reason why nature study takes that special place. And it has to do with the wonder and beauty of nature that is really, um, that, that really is, uh, is without peer or without imitation. And I just want to throw one other little note out here. So I've been to, um, I visited in, in Ambleside in England, um, the archive of the teacher training college. I've been there many times and I've looked through the boxes of all the old notes and papers and everything like that. And there was an official nature notebook that was that was uh, given to teachers in training and I measured the dimensions they were all the ones the samples there were they were exactly the same size and the measures were exactly seven inches by nine inches which happens to be the same exact dimensions as this notebook that I bought from uh, from Jack Laws and from his website so isn't it extraordinary that even the seven inches what, what were the odds that that Charlotte Mason would have settled on on a dimension of her notebook that was the same as you so I think um, so I think it's a, a wonderful thing that uh, that, uh, that, that, that um, we have this historical connection to know that while in many ways, you know, the nature education that you're talking about, Jack, is on the cutting edge, but in other ways, um, you're kind of going on, you're, you're treading on, on ground that, that others have treaded on before and, and that we're able to build on those ideas and repopularize those ideas and have confidence that there's something of, of lasting and enduring value in them. Yeah, and, and, and all of those insights in the context of the system that she was in is, is even more amazing. You know, all these things, we're, we're talking about all the, you know, you know growth mindset. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, the, uh, the, the metadata in the, the, the journals. Um, we just had a, a, a workshop, our educator workshop last week was on writing haiku and poetry in your journal. Yeah, um, we've right. talked about one. this idea of it. I notice. I wonder. It reminds me of and projecting that out at the world, and then turning that same frame of reference into yourself and using. I notice. I wonder. It reminds me of to observe how. Are, what is your own experience of that? Um, what does that make you wonder about? What questions come up for you of that? And then what connections can you make off of that? And she is doing that. Um, back in 1886. It's amazing. It's, 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 it's beautiful. So, I mean, you know, we want to, we want to kind of keep track of, of our roots and, and where these ideas come from. And the, um, I, I in, in nature journaling, I believe that we should constantly be looking at other people's journaling processes and ideas 
And what I, what I do is I look through other people's journals. I'm constantly looking for an idea. Oh, I can take that. I can use that. Oh, I can use this. And then you kind of reform it into this other thing. And then you take that idea from this person and that idea from this person. And you can kind of be a scavenger taking all these ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also in doing that, you know, the more that I can say like, you know, this is a trick that I learned on drawing birds from Keith Hansen. Um, this is, um, a, a, a trick that, um, you know, like this idea of, of I notice, I, I wonder, it reminds me of out and then turning it back in towards myself. Yeah, I learned that from Emily Ligren, right? And so to note the, where we get these ideas from and, um, you know, to be creative people, we don't have to, you know, be, the, 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 we used to think that like, oh, you're gonna make some idea that's totally new, right? Um, or is it that all these ideas, they've been kind of floating around, sort of finding what is useful, finding mm -hmm. kind of what you can, what kind of resonates for you, latching onto those and using those to, to, to repurpose those for your, your own next level of thinking. But also then in that process, to wherever possible, keep track of, oh, I learned this from here. I learned mm. this from here. I learned this from Kevin. I learned this from Emily. Um, I learned this from Sylvia. And, um, and this is an idea that came to me while reading Mary Oliver, right? Mm. Um, you know, now we're able to push back sort of the, the, the edge of some of these ideas of you know, where they're coming from. And I wonder, wouldn't it be, don't we wish that we could kind of sit down at, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely inviting Charlotte Mason to my kind of, you know, my, 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 my fantasy, you know, dinner party. You think about like who the people are that you want to have around at the table. And um, so she's on my list. Um, this, as an educator, kind of understanding some of my roots, this is really, really helpful. And also to see how all these pieces fit together um, is incredibly empowering and inspiring. And thank you so much, Art, for coming and playing with us today. This, yeah. is, this has been really exciting. Um, I thought that we would um, we would we'd have time for a bunch of questions and, and, and answers, but I see that our uh, we got so um, into it that I see that our hour <laughs> is up. Um, the um, why don't um, um, a, 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 did you see any questions that popped up that um, we didn't address? Um, that you think would be really kind of high percentage. Maybe we'll, we'll take only two because then we have to let everybody kind of get back to their lives. And I also told Art that this would just take one hour. And we're now four minutes over that. Um, well, um, it, what I've been noticing in the chat hasn't been um, as many questions about what, what the presenting is, but more the discussion about how these ideas resonate and then questions about how, um, what sorts of materials to get. Um, what, like what kind of books to read um, with for Charlotte Mason in order to help implement these. Um, and yeah, yeah, a bunch of people are asking how to select and understand um, the books. Um, somebody was asking about a nature journaling in extreme weathers. And so a bunch of us were giving, were giving her ideas. Um, yeah. Oh, there's a question here. Jenny Jo Johnson says, Jack, you mentioned that since the CM conference in 2016, you've changed some of the ways you teach. I'm curious what those were and what did you find so useful? Um, so the sort of being exposed to Charlotte Mason and especially this idea of narration hmm. um, rocked my world. Hmm. Um, the idea that it's not yours until it kind of comes in and then it's going to come out hmm. as, as something that you present to the world. And um, that's such a creative way of thinking about information. Like I'm gonna take this stuff in, it's gonna 
gestate and germinate in here. And then that's going to come out as something, maybe something on my page, maybe it's sort of ideas, maybe it's sort of something we engage. So it's kind of taking, for me, it also kind of combines this, so it's sort of the maker mentality stuck onto learning, right? Mm. That, you know, oh, you haven't made anything with this. It's not mine yet, mm. right? Um, mm. And so um, that has changed the, I, I find sort of the, the, this I, I, idea kind of coming up in, in discussions in teaching when I'm doing stuff with my kids I'm constantly sort of thinking back to this idea of, of narration. And um, it's made me much more intentional. You know, the other night, um, our family sat down and we watched a movie together. And then in the past, I, I, we would have a little discussion about these sorts of things. Um, or, or the, but when you're thinking about it sort of through the lens of narration, you know, we can now sort of let's, let's narrate it. And then, and then we've got this platform sort of for, for making things and playing with these ideas more. Um, I absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. And the, and also you've, you've heard me talk before about like, this is your brain on paper. I refer to nature journaling as like, okay, this is your brain. This is your brain on paper. Um, that idea is also um, that's 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 narration. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would say that 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 principle has probably been for me the 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 biggest sort of tipping point in how I think about things and how I and you, you'll you'll see me talking about all sorts of those things kind of related and tying into that. Like if if you're listening to to, to me talking now, some of these ideas, so, so some of the ideas since 2016 um, are things that have matured and developed um, in the kind of fermentation vat with all of Mason's ideas. My mm -hmm. ideas were in sync enough with them before I went out there um, that they asked me to go out and talk at the Charlotte Mason conference. Otherwise they wouldn't have asked me to go. So there, there were things that we were doing that were in sync. Um, but that's what made the, the conversations with art at the supper table, just so much fun because, you know, we would be just like, it was like this, this mind dump and like, you know, you know like Mason ideas, like nature journaling ideas, Mason ideas, nature journaling ideas. And we're like seeing how all these pieces kind of fit together. And you see here from this discussion here, the beautiful way that these do come together. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really exciting. So um, the, there's, there are other um, questions here about um, living books and, and, and other things that are relating to Mason, which is a, a, also a really big part of what she does. I think that that is probably best done in a conversation for, for another time. Um, but um, Basically, that there there are certain books that absolutely rock, and she gets good books, and then they do narration off of those. So then people are talking about living books. That's sort of what they're they're talking about. Um, the if if people wanted maybe one thing we can do that'd be kind of a useful resource. If people wanted to learn more about Charlotte Mason education at this point, um, are there a couple of places that you would suggest to direct them, and also maybe tell people about your um, website and podcast, the, the the stuff that you do. Um, with um, uh, relating to this. If people would like to follow you more, yeah. uh, which I recommend that people do because thinker and, uh, and, and, and a real kind of game changing um, maker over there. Um, so how, what, where would, might people go? Yeah, so I think uh, just for a general introduction to Charlotte Mason, I still think that Susan Schaefer Macaulay's 1984 book still remains kind of the most accessible entry point for somebody to just get started. So it's called For the Children's Sake. It's uh, been reprinted. Um, it's, it's really um, the go-to book that I strongly recommend starting with. Um, and then to, to go deeper on some of the topics we've discussed here, 
Um, my, if you go to my website or my team's website, it's uh, charlottemasonpoetry.org and there's a topical index. So there's a menu bar across the top and you click on topical index and then just search on nature notebook. There's a, there's a series of, of articles that we have both new articles as well as what I call vintage articles um, describing nature notebooks. Um, so there's an article I wrote called uh, Nature Notebooks in the 21st Century that talks about how, how uh, the kind of the history of Charlotte Mason's approach and then how I, I believe it can be incorporated in, in today's context. And then there are, there are several other um, classic articles on nature notebooking and nature journaling that go to the next level of detail on all the topics that we've talked about. So charlottemasonpoetry.org, topical index, search on nature notebooks. There's a little table that has all of those links. And then um, we've also talked a bit about uh, neuroplasticity and growth mindset and stuff like that. Um, if you also go on, on charlottemasonpoetry.org or on our podcast, which is also called Charlotte Mason Poetry, there's a talk I gave called Habits for Life. And uh, this talk, Habits for Life, it's about a 60 minute presentation that I gave that really talks about neuroplasticity um, in Charlotte Mason's day and how that kind of carries in and is still applicable for us for today. So that's another kind of deeper dive um, into, into one of these topics. So I think those would be some resources that, that I would recommend. Art, again, thank you so much for being here with us. This was, um, <laughs> I, I'm very glad we have this recorded because I've got a big you know, page of, 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 of notes <laughs> and, and, and ideas and thoughts all kind of mind mapped here. But oh, I also really great. want to, um, to listen to this again because there, there, there's levels of uh, thoughts and idea here and ideas here that are, are just are, are, are game changing and I'd like, the, the, the way you've put them together and the, the turns of phrase are, um, are really powerful to help me in my process as, a, as an educator. Um, Awesome. Well, it's great to be back, and it's it's really an honor for me, Jack, because uh, you know you you've personally impacted my life and the life of my family so much in terms of helping me, like I said, to put these ideas into practice and to um, really be able to experience as you know, kind of as a as an adult, to be able to discover a new world of of love for nature. And I wouldn't be the person I am today if I hadn't met you back in 2016. So it's it's very fulfilling to be here and to have this conversation. So all the best and, uh, and I look forward to when we get to cross paths again. I'm also looking forward to that. Um, and again, if, if all of you are at the next Mason conference that um, Art and I um, both uh, attend together, um, come on over to our, our, our table in the dining room hall because this conversation, we're just, we're just getting started on this. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, uh, we are, we're lifelong learners. And um, I want to uh, just invite everybody to play with these ideas, find out which ones for you really excite you. And um, let's let um, some of, let's let these ideas kind of steep, steep in our heads and sort of play with them and see what starts to change. What starts to change. And I'd like to also keep this conversation alive Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to keep this, this, this conversation alive in our educator community here. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to be playing with these ideas um, a lot in the future. Again, Art, a pleasure, uh, absolute delight to, to see you again. Thank you. And uh, Nature Journaling educators around the world who have uh, hopped on to join us. Thank you all so much for being here. And um, uh, want to, if, if you're new to this, um, we're, uh, every week there is a, an open forum. Usually it's a big group discussion. I think that we're going to probably need uh, some group time to process some of these ideas. Um, so maybe we'll build that into our next Wednesday's um, group event. Again, Art, an absolute pleasure. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.